Today, uh, who we have here to be answering questions on systems dependent and not people dependent is Tim. So thank you, Tim, for sharing your knowledge here with us today. Yeah, all good. It's a, it's a great topic and it's pretty core to, uh, to WISE. Um, I've noticed a lot of people uh, recently, maybe in the last year or so, who have been drawn to WISE uh, in particular have been asking about what systems we have and what systems Ed and Jamie use to run their businesses. So it's a great topic. In terms of the systems, there are really a few key systems that we use at WISE to run our businesses. So they are as best as they can be systems dependent. I'll just say at the outset, accounting firms, bookkeeping firms, it is a people business. You know, it's not software. We use a lot of software. It's not software. You still need people. So what we're not, we're not saying people aren't important. We're not saying um, you don't want to find good people, but we're just saying if you think about the deep and narrow team as a system of just people, what we had when I met Ed and started working with Ed, I had about 15 accountants on shore and I was treading on eggshells to use Ed's language around all of them because they were wide and shallow. They all managed a portfolio of two to $300,000 in clients. And uh, if any single one of them left, um, there was a big hole in knowledge uh, about the client processes, what have you. And one thing I've noticed in the last year, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, frankly, people have had trouble hiring good talent. We've spoken to a, a very large accounting firm in India. And even in India, with a population in excess of a billion, he said that their biggest struggle in the last year has been finding accountants in India, which kind of blew my mind. So one of the things I've noticed is people really struggle to find talent. And one of the first things Ed said to me when I started working with him about five years ago now was when you have a deep and narrow team, you still do need, you know, leaders. You need people who have CPAs or who are technical, at least one per team, but you only need one per team. And when you think about that one for, for a million in fees versus I had probably three or four CPAs per million in fees who all had five to 10 years experience. That's leverage. So any system is about a couple of things. One of the main things we, we we love about systems is it gives you leverage. And what I found is we very, very luckily set these teams up before the pandemic happened. And throughout the pandemic, we just never had a problem that we didn't have enough staff. And it wasn't because we had hundreds of employees. It's because we had the right employees played in the right position and we were able to leverage off them. And we were able to hire much more inexperienced accountants than we used to be able to hire because we plugged them under more experienced uh, accountants and we got that leverage for the first time in our 20 year history. So, you know, the deep and narrow team, even though it's people, a team made up of people, that's still a system for building out teams and for hiring as well. So that's one good example of a system. Another, um, the divisions, the seven divisions, and this mm. is the other key one. I, I think one of the reasons so many accounting firm owners came to wise mentoring and why I came to wise mentoring was because in, in, in my own experience, the whole business, $3 million business was based around one person who was the owner. And if you took them out, the whole thing just fell apart. Talk about people dependent. It was really dependent on one person, the owner. And I think a lot of people who come to us have that problem. It means they're a slave to the business. It means they can't go on holidays. If they get sick, they're worried things are going to happen. You know, they have to work insane hours, all kinds of things. And the bigger the firms get, the worse the problem, you know, which doesn't seem to make intuitive sense, but that was very much our experience. We had about 18 staff, 3 million in revenue. It was still people dependent on one person. And so Ed's whole way of, of thinking about the business as seven divisions, um, we've probably heard us talk about them before, board, division one, division two, marketing, division three, sales, which is the client manager division. Division four, production, division five, quality control, and division six, administration, and division seven, internal accounts. This way of thinking of the business and carving up into seven different parts is itself a system for withdrawing and, not, and having accountability and being able to scale as well. So you can scale by having deep and narrow teams. And every time you get close to a million, you, you make another deep and narrow team. And you only have to have one superstar 
if you even want to call it that per million in fees. And then the other major system we've got is these seven divisions. And as you grow, you can find more and more people in the business who naturally tend towards CMO, CFO, COO, CTO, and they can start wearing those hats. And the business owner can, can stop wearing seven hats and they can wear six hats, five hats, four hats, until the only hats the business owner's wearing are the ones that they actually want to wear. Usually it's sales or marketing or it's on the board and like a chairman role, which is what um, Ed, Ed and Jamie currently are um, in their own businesses. So um, that's at a broad kind of top-down view. It's very, very broad, kind of the big rocks we call them, the boulders. Those are two really important systems or ways of systematizing the business so that you can start to get people to help you run it and you can get on the journey to having it run without you. That's absolutely um, fundamental, isn't it, Tim? Like a lot of firms, they start thinking of systems in terms of, I need to install these apps. I need to yeah, um, yeah, get yeah. this tech stack going. Uh, yeah. Can you just give me your library of SOPs and procedures? And yeah. maybe I'll make my staff read a novel over the holidays or something, and they'll come back systems ready. But what you're really talking about at its core is the people and you know, you and I and Christy, what we've all seen is how fundamental that has been for the firms, not just for ourselves, but in WISE, in allowing it to be managed from the bottom up, because we're seeing a lot of owners having to spend a lot of their time commanding that ship. You know, they're, they're having to micromanage everything. They can't trust their staff. But what you're describing there sounds like, if, you know, if everyone is able to perform in their own role, inside of their divisions within that deep and narrow team structure, that would make people just run really well mechanically. Yeah. Obviously, like I said at the start, you need people to run the business. Like we're not saying systems dependent, get rid of people. We've never said that. Um, what we're trying to say is you need fewer good people to run much larger businesses than before. And that's where tech comes in. And the other where, place I've seen in my own firm over the last 20 years where we've become too dependent on people is when all the IP or knowledge or, or what have you is locked up in people's heads and it's not documented. Often the worst who are perpetrating um, th you know, this business in, if you will, are the owners. The owners have so much in their head um, and owners tend to be either time poor or, or too disorganized or what have you to document these things. And I guess after having deep and narrow teams for production, which is another whole session, after dividing the business into the seven divisions and starting to figure out who can be heading up each division with no bypass and actually responsible for that division, the next thing I would say that that really is um, uh, the key to making systems is the ASOPs. And we've done a fair few sessions on them this year. And they're really probably one of the biggest improvements to the new wise hub versus the old wise hub that Jamie's been building out. He's been putting a lot of work into this, um, into this part of the new wise hub, which we can show you in a bit if people would like to see it, but um, it's just SOPs. It's just absolutely key. And SOPs, we talk about the four quads. SOPs are really quad two. They're not urgent, but they're important. Right. And a lot of us get trapped in quad one, which is urgent and important, and quad three, which is urgent but not important. The urgent things, regardless of whether or not they're important, steal our attention. The way I try to make quad two urgent is, is I think, what if this employee wasn't going to be here tomorrow? What if they were going on maternity leave? What if they quit? What if they got sick? What if they went on holidays in a crucial moment? What would we do? And if the answer is we'd scramble around and try to figure out how to do what they were doing, we probably don't have enough SOPs around whatever they were doing, if that makes sense. So there's obviously things like um, triaging software and there's a lot of solutions out there that, that, you know, just for pure communication storing. I'm not so much talking about that. It's more what happens if your admin person goes, who knows how to use the billing software? We had about 20 employees, or just under 20 employees, about 18 employees. We only had one person who knew how to make the lodgement lists and break them up into the three teams. Really simple mm. thing. It was probably the very first SOP or how-to video I ever made was I sat down with him. Instead of asking this guy, who was relatively expensive, pretty senior guy, to make this report every month, which is really an admin task, I sat down with him and I said, how do you do that? And I wrote out how he did it. And I, I've got to be really clear here. We're not trying to make people redundant by doing this. And when you start doing this, you've got to kind of tread carefully with your staff. Because if you start asking your employees, 
how do you do this? How do you do that? And start documenting things. People naturally, the tendency is to think, oh my goodness, they're going to try to replace me. That's why they're documenting it. And you've just got to reiterate and explain. And I always give context whenever I do something in my business. I say, no, no, we're not, we're not trying to make anyone redundant here or we know we're not trying to replace you or anything. It's just, it's not a very robust business if one person goes on leave or gets sick and the whole thing stops, you know? So ideally every single thing that's important in the business should be documented. At least at the very least, it should be a quick five minute video that you make when you're showing someone else how to do it. At the most, you should have like, a, you know, a very well laid out SOP. I get pushed back all the time. People say, oh, but what if we change the process? That's fine. You can't edit a blank sheet of paper. You still need to have a process written down. And I would much rather have a bunch of processes that were, you know, needing to be updated than no processes at all. You know, so one of the things we do, we don't have an SOP for this yet, Thomas. But one of the things we do have is uh, every six months, we have this process where we're reviewing the current SOPs, especially the ones that are reliant on tech. They tend to really need to be updated at least yearly. So I would really, really encourage you if you haven't started documenting things yet, start documenting don't get paralysis by analysis. Don't get overwhelmed. Whatever happens today that doesn't have an SOP, make an SOP for it. And again, to make it urgent, I say, what if I'm not here tomorrow? What if something happens to me? What are all the things that I do that I haven't documented? Because I assume I'm always going to be here because, you know, I'm in, you know, I, I have equity pretty much. It's like I'm, I'm involved in the business at that level. I'm never not going to be here. You never want to think like that. You, you want to make yourself redundant or you want to replace yourself, or you want to be able to give your role to your best employee who's, who's looking for that promotion track. So yeah, I think really investing in the SOPs, and it takes at least a year to get all the core ones documented, really investing in the SOPs, making sure uh, you document them and you get a culture in your business for documenting them. So a lot of my employees now, if they're showing someone how to use some software and they'll make a video for it. Or if they're showing someone, they're doing some internal training, like, you know, around the production work, they'll, they'll make a video for it. So we're starting to get a culture now where the staff in a bottom-up type way are saying, hey, we need an SOP for this or hey, we need a video for this. And then sometimes they're just making them themselves. And the last thing I'll say on that, to make sure it happens, again, to make it urgent, urgent when it's not urgent, um, we build it into our weekly tacticals. So I would say you can't have accountability without documentation, like how to do things. What does this role entail? What does a CMO look after? What does a CTO look after? You need documentation for accountability. The other thing you need for accountability, and this is a system in itself and probably the last, last of the four systems or three that I've mentioned today, is to have routine rhythm. And the best way to have routine and rhythm is through frequent meetings. So every week, me and my senior managers, the team leaders get together and have a weekly tactical. And guess what? Once a month on the first, um, on the second Monday of every month, which would be, I think today, we look at, because we had a public holiday yesterday, we look at the SOPs. We say, are there, what are the top three SOPs that need to be approved this week because they govern tasks that, that the business does every week? And so to make something that's not urgent and important, urgent and important, because systematizing your business is not urgent, to make it urgent, we've built it into our weekly and monthly meetings so that... Mm. 12 months down the track, we'll have, we'll have approved 50 odd SOPs if we do what three, three a month, maybe, maybe more, maybe less, but that's a system. A system is you're building a handbook. You took mentioned McDonald's before you're in board, you're building employee or an owner's manual. And if we're all abducted by aliens, you know, or there was a rapture or whatever it is, I love that show. Um, the remain, uh, the leftovers, I think it's called. If we all disappeared and people came in and found this handbook, they could run our business or they could run Ed's business or Jamie's business or even wise mentoring according to this handbook. And they would get very similar results to what we were getting that system dependent, not people dependent because the people have been completely interchangeable, but they're getting comparable results. That's so the system is producing the results. People following the systems producing the results, not extraordinary people who are creating the system in their head and it stays in their head. That's a big one, Tim, um, when you're mentioning that. And I um, think that really summarizes it really well, getting those similar results, no matter what the inputs are. Because if the system is built with enough thought and development and enough has been invested in there, we should be able to get the same McChicken meal every single time. You know, We should be able to produce the same level of quality tax return every single time. 